My name is Ray. My wife Diane is with me this morning. Um, Boyd called me uh, a week ago Friday. He said, listen, I want to be on with you speak. I said, sure, I'm glad to. He says, but I'm going to assign you a topic. And he doesn't know this, but I am the worst topical preacher in the world, okay? And I don't know why he assigned me this. I guess he was thinking of me. But he said, you need to speak on the stick of me. And I said, okay, boy, I'll get you back. <laughs> But anyhow, that's what we're going to take a look at this morning. If that's okay, I was asked if I have a PowerPoint. No, we didn't have time. Okay, last week I was preaching in Walton, Colorado. Uh, I, uh, in the 70s, I pastored in Walsenburg, Colorado. Many of y'all may know where that is. About 50 miles south of Pueblo. In the 80s, I pastored in uh, Pueblo, at Pueblo West Baptist Church. And in 1990, I went to Temple Baptist Church in Salida, Colorado. I stayed there 21 years, and I retired two years ago. And uh, since that time... Uh, I have preached all over this place, okay? Um, I spent a year in Longmont at uh, Long Street Church helping them out. They're still without a pastor. And uh, so that's kind of what I do now, okay? I just travel a lot and preach a lot. And when I do come to this church, I said, well, I bet y'all on my seat, okay? I said, well, I bet they're in the back because that's me. I don't want to be involved. I want to be sitting in the back before I want to be, okay? Well, the Spickable Me. Well, now, I, I saw the first one, the Spickable Me one. Did I see that? About Groove. And he set out to do evil until he met three little girls named Margo, Agnes, Steve. And then all of a sudden, man, he turned good. Okay, now the second movie is a little bit different than that. I've not seen it, but I've read about it, okay? I did not have time to go see it this week. But it's not so much about how bad he was and then he became good, but it's how he is going to be going after a master villain because he set out to be a master villain himself. And so as we started that, as I started thinking about that, well, you know, Despicable Me is actually more about the first movie than the second movie. Okay? Now, the favorite characters in the in Despicable Me movies are the minions. Don't you love those guys? I love those minions. I want to create my own minions. Okay? I want to create, I want to take them golfing with me when I get a good shot. They stand there and go, I need minions like that. And, and so I, I, I would like to do that. But as we think about Despicable Me and Gru this morning, and as I looked at it, there were a lot of things I began to think about. I went back through the Bible. And I looked first at Abraham. I said, now, was he on Despicable Me type? And, uh, and as I thought about the topic that, that Lord gave me, he says, now, this is what you're going to preach on. I'm glad you told me what I was going to preach on. But he says, choosing to do good when you want to do bad. Hmm. Choosing to do good. I went back to the Bible. I began to look at people. How about Moses? He was kind of a reluctant leader, wasn't he? He was kind of a reluctant servant. How about Jonah? John didn't want to do what God asked him to do. He had to choose to do it. And all throughout the Bible, and then I came to one in the Bible in the New Testament, Paul, who I think was probably the greatest despicable me of any character in all of God's wisdom. Because he's such an interesting guy. He is such a, a, a interesting character. And I relate so well to Paul because of his character and everything. Now, I realize that you don't know how I preach, and I don't know how you listen, but I do know this, that the average American adult attention span is 17 and a half minutes. Okay? But, and you younger folks in here, you're about 15 minutes. Okay? But let me tell you this. If your cup gets full, that's okay. Just tune me out. I don't care. All right? That's fine with me. But I want to share some things with you today. If I, if I might be able to do that and, and just and just uh, ask you to think about some of these things about being despicable me. Okay, now how if, if, if I want to how do I choose to do good when I really want to do bad? Now as I got to thinking about that, why would I want to do bad anyhow? The Bible says that the heart is no good. Uh, I mean we just naturally have that tendency towards sin, don't we? I mean, we've got four granddaughters, and those granddaughters are so lovely. And, and little Naomi is, is, is one of my favorites. That's my son's youngest daughter. And, and her and Papa have this special thing. You know, guys, if you've got a, if you've got a granddaughter, isn't that great? I raised the daughter, I raised the son, but I tell you, grandkids are wonderful, aren't they? Oh, man, if I knew they don't be so good, I'd have them first. But they're just so beautiful. And Naomi is so precious. And her and Papa have this thing. We watch a movie together. She curls up in my lap because she knows I have the human ends. And the popcorn and the stuff she likes. 
And, and she's, she's just so special. But let me tell you something. That little girl who is so special to pop off, she has a sin on her. She desires to be that. And her mom and her dad and her grandmother and her grandfather teach her to be good. But it's a choice she has to make. And in all of our lives, it is the same way. It is a choice that we have to make. Now, I'm going to read you a scripture that, that has meant a lot to me through the years. It's found in Romans. And uh, it's Romans 7. And it starts in the 14th verse. And I, I want you to listen to this scripture. It's such a beautiful, beautiful scripture. I love the way Paul puts this. He said that we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. Now that one hit home for me. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. For what I hate to do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree with the law that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. You have that struggle? Here's my favorite verse out of all this, verse 19. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. You like that? What I think at all? I think Paul had a despicable me complex. I found out something about Ray Edmonds too. He's got a despicable me complex, okay? Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it. It is the sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a despicable man I am. It says wretched. Well, I think despicable will be a better translation when I come out with Ray Standard Virgin RSV. Despicable is going to be a okay. despicable me. Oh, what a despicable man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Who's going to come and rescue me from this predicament, from all of this problem, from all of this despicableness in me? And he says this, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see that? So there's an answer to our despicableness. And you know when I read that scripture, when Roy talked to me about what to preach on and everything, I said, wow, oh, see that, that scripture really fits. It fits me. And you know, I think it fits every follower of Jesus Christ. Paul was one of those guys who was very despicable. It says in the Bible that he went from house to house wreaking havoc or hauling out the men and women that were in that house and throwing them into prison. And then we know that on the Damascus Road in the ninth chapter of Acts, he met Jesus Christ and it made a difference because in verses 1 through 9, he got saved and in verse 20, he preached. I changed him, didn't he? You think about it change that came over his life and yet later in his life he writes something like Romans 7 and tells us about the struggle that goes on in his life all the time. You know, of all the people in the world that I have the biggest problem with, it's me. Okay? I don't have a problem with anybody else. I have a problem with me. He's the only one in this church that I struggle with. Me. Why is that? I keep on say like Sylvester the cat. Mm -hmm. I have a problem with being despicable. But you know, as you think about it, every one of us has that same problem. And it's because of ourselves. Now, I don't know if you're like me or not, but I have a PhD in dumb things. <laughs> I have a tendency to do dumb things. I mean, dumb decisions, I say the dumbest things, I do some of the dumbest things you've ever seen in your life. But I have that. That's part of who I am because of the nature that lives within me and within my heart. And I have to deal with myself on that. I have to every moment of every day deal with a sin in my life. Do you? Well, I do. 
It's not pleasant sometimes. It's not easy sometimes. In fact, I find it getting older, I get the harder it is. Because I can say, well, oh, you know, I can give myself the benefit of the doubt. No, I can't. Because you're old, it's no excuse. Just because you're young, it's no excuse. Every follower of Jesus Christ deals with sin. No, doing something when you know it is absolutely wrong. You know, sometimes watching the politics and the news and the laws that the legislature passed, sometimes I, I sit back and I go, Oh God, what's wrong with this world? And you know the answer he always gives me is me. It's not the politicians in Washington or Denver. It's me. It's not my wife, it's me. It's not my kids, it's me. It's not my grandkids, it's me. It is me. It's not the pastor of the church. You know who it is? It's you. Yeah, I can say that. But I probably do that Boy, do you. And so I have to deal with that sin and the service that God has called me to do. You know what my natural nature is? It is to come into a church and sit on the back of you and just do it. Y'all look a lot better from the front than you do the back. And you know the greatest theologian in all of cartoons is Lucy from the Nights. And you know, I think she hit the nail on the head when she says, I love humanity. Amen? You know what our next phrase was? It's people I can't stand. You know, I have a hard time dealing with people because I don't want to be in the front. I don't want to be in the back. I have a hard time dealing with people because I don't want to see them face to face. I don't want to just leave them alone. But that's what so God says, good, I want to call you the pastor Jesus. Lord, I'm That's not me. That's not what I want to do. You're going to pass me Jesus. I'll be there. And you know, every one of us, we would choose to do that which is bad when we need to choose that which is good. Because when we deal with people, sometimes we think the wrong thing about them, don't you? You know, I bet you thought I had a southern accent and you thought, boy, is your pastor. I mean, I'm from Alabama. I spent the first 20 years of my life in Alabama. Life's 45. I've been out here. And I still have a little bit of an accent, and I've got a lot of that accent. You're probably thinking, idiot, Mark's law. Don't you make a grass judgment like that on people? I do. I don't mind telling you, I do that. I tell you what, I can meet a person I've met in five minutes. I can imagine their life is probably long, but I can imagine. Last week we were driving up to uh, Walden and we went up to the canyon and you know, we go over Sunday morning in the village. On the end of June, and you're driving up through the canyon. You know what you're going to do? Uh, RVs. You know what I hate? Getting behind one. Don't you? I hate getting behind RVs. Because you begin to think all kinds of things about that person out there. And pretty soon, you're going to quit thinking those things, and you're going to start speaking those things. Well, he doesn't know how to drive. Look at him, look at him, look at him. He's pulling a 30-foot RV and he ran off the road by six inches. Did you see that? My wife would say, no, I saw it. He doesn't know how to drive because once we start thinking the wrong thing about people, we'll start saying the wrong thing about people. And God grabbed me and convicted me and I just stretched my hand toward the RV and I said, Lord, God, just bless him. And bless him somewhere else. And then we start doing the wrong thing. I have come to the conclusion that in our fallen, sinful, self-centered condition, we cannot get along with each other. Sorry. And the only way that you and I can get along with others is through the supernatural power of Jesus Christ. So we love something. You know what I mean? My natural state, I can't go on with anybody. Someone asked me one time, Pastor said, What's the best comedian in the church? I said, Media free. What comedian is it? 
Well, I'm going to find a different one. Well, who's on that committee? I'm going to be myself and I. That's the committee of the church. That's just the way we are. So when we deal with ourselves, we deal with the other people, and we think the wrong thing, we say the wrong thing, we do the wrong thing. You know what I've, I've come to understand about following Jesus Christ and dealing with other people? It is a learned activity. It does not come naturally. I have to learn to deal with myself and my sin. I have to learn to deal with other people. It does not come naturally. It is something that I... That's why they use the word disciple. You're right. Well, it, it, ourselves and others, what about the church itself? What about the church and where do I fit in? Should the church be united? If you think so, say yes. If you're awake, say yes. Okay. Yeah. Should the church be united? Yes. Am I going on my 17 and a half minutes on that? Yeah, it should be, should be. Where should we be united the most? At one point in the life of a church, where should the church be united more than any other place? Do you know? How about when we sit down to eat? We all like food, don't we? All right? Well, let me tell you something. I don't like fried chicken. I don't like tomatoes. I don't like squash. I can't put anything in my mouth that sounds like a squash. Sounds like roti chicken. Where'd you get that? Found it over the road. It was washed. I bet some of y'all like fried chicken, don't you? I bet some of y'all like tomatoes, don't you? I bet some of y'all even like squash. Don't you? I don't. I do like taters. I got my grandkids calling them taters and taters now, and it's about my parents have to I do like taters. I do like meat. Red meat. Kind of clogs and pork. Those are the best ones. So it's not over milk. I know, I know, I know. The place where the church is united the most is in a business meeting. Isn't that right? I don't know if it's like any church I live in, Pastor. You know what you need to be united more than any place? That's when you gather in this place right here for worship. We can let our differences go. We can let everything go. We can sing together. We can hear the Word preached and talk to us. We can take that Word and apply it to us. This ought to be the place where Christians are united more than anything else when they are kneeling and praising and they are worshiping Almighty God. That's what we need to do. I'll be honest with you, we've been kind of attending here for two years when we be here. I don't know how united we are in worship to you. How do you? I don't know. Maybe I'll find out. But we need to be here. And be united. So we gather, we need to be united because we will make good choices. And to be united, you've got to choose to be good instead of even when you want to do bad. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to go in and Kyle better sing some good songs. I'm going to go in that place and I'm going to worship it. Well, we better preach a good song. I'm going to go in there, but the sound better be right. I'm going to go in there, but it better not be too hot. Better not be too cold. Do you have those in this church? You know what I did in my last church? We put a thermostat in the foyer of the church and we told them to control all the air conditioning in the building. And you could go by and adjust it at any time you wanted to. It was connected to nothing. <laughs> we put a plastic box over it so that people think it really worked. Had my older ladies come by and they get the class to doctor. Some of the young people come by and they do a thing that made them feel better. Well, we need to be together in those things, don't we? How about when we give? Should we do the right thing and choose to do that which is good instead of that which is bad? 
you know, my mom, she said this, thing, like, she's still alive, she's 92 years old, and she's, she's a prayer warrior, she's a beautiful lady. And, and that sweet lady, she taught me a lesson as a kid, as a little boy going to a Methodist church in Birmingham, Alabama, I, she taught me to tithe. If I'd go out and mow a lawn for a quart, I'd give two and a half cents to the church. I was always putting that in. And she made me round it up to three. If I cut it for 50 cents, I took a nickel out of what I got and gave it to the church. She taught me to do that. Even when times were pretty hard on us, she taught me to do that. There's no question in my home whether or not we find it. We've got it. to do the right thing. I'm glad the boys got more on this entire thing. Very nice. And you know, we, we need to be a part of, of the team that God has said. You can choose to be a part of the team. I like the word team. I preached a series of sermons on one time called uh, Together Everyone Accomplishes Good. And the team is the idea. And you're part of the family. Has he preached on the long range of you? Go out for my favorite character that's going 40 years on the radio and television. Long Ranger and Tonto. Didn't you like that? Yeah. And, and, yeah, I remember seeing it come on our little black and white TV and the you know, Maria Wheatfields would be waving back and forth and the way you tell the Witcher would start and he would go high on silver. That was his horse name, right? And then he had his friend, John Depp. You know, Tonto, right? What was Tonto's horse's name? Scout. Okay. In 40 years on radio television, how many men did the Long Ranger kill? I know. Zero. Never killed one. And the Long Ranger, he still had a team. He had Tonto and Silver and Scout because they could just whistle. Their horses were gone. You ever had a horse like that? I never had a dog like that. <laughs> and Tonto would call him Team Star. You know, that means trust me for him. Let me tell you something. You cannot be a follower of Jesus Christ and be a long ranger. That would part of the team. You know, we retired two years ago. We faced something we haven't faced in our married life. And that was to find a church to be a part of. We didn't have done that. I mean, I've seen people look and come in churches like the pastor and look us over and everything. I had never done that. For a long time. That was tough on me. I dying. And we haven't had the time to really look at me. We like attending here at 8 o'clock in the morning, coming to church. We like it. And you know, a lot of times when we come to a church, and when you come to a church, you need to plug into it. You need to be a part of the team. Jesus Christ saved you. Isn't that right? But He did not save you to sit in your chair. He saved you to serve. Mm-hmm. And there's something you can do to serve. You know, I think the most joyous folks in the church are those who are doing, doing something. And not those who are just sitting back. I have these people in the church, and those who are involved. I'm going to close with two illustrations of my friends. It's people with me choosing to do the right thing when I really want to do the wrong thing. That's hard to do. But it's a choice you make. It's a learned activity. It is not something you just do automatically. You have to learn my last church, our music leader had perfect pitch. I hate people like that. Perfect pitch. Then the day, boom, there it is. Then the beat, boom, there it is. Or do you want to I don't know nothing about music. I'm sorry. She, she did it. Great music. She was so, so into that, though. Four times a year, Mr. King would come to Colorado Springs and tune every piano in that church. Whether he used it or not, she had it tuned. I, 
met Mr. King kind of early in my ministry there and everything. And he was sitting in the auditorium between the piano and he had his wrench on there. And he would pick a tuning fork out with boom. And he'd tweak it. Boom. And he'd tweak it. He said, man, what's interesting? I said, tell me about this a little bit. What do you know? How do you tune a piano? I don't know nothing about this. And he sat down and he told me about that and everything. And I said, so you tune every piano to this set of tuning forks? He said, you see, if we had a hundred pianos in this room, and he said, if I tune this one over here to the, my tuning forks, and then tune this piano to that piano, and this piano to that piano, and this piano to that piano, and this piano to that piano, he said, we got the number 100 over here. He said, it would be so far out of tune, you wouldn't recognize it as a piano. But he said, I'll tune this one to my tuning fork, I'll tune this one to my tuning forks, I'll tune this one to my tuning fork. And he said, when they're tuned to all the same source, all wow. That's pretty good. You want to make the right choice? You want to do that? Tune your life to Jesus Christ. He will always allow you to make the right choice. He will give you the wisdom to make the right choice. James says, if you lack wisdom, ask God to give it to you. Well, I pray that all the time. God, give me wisdom. It's so important. Because every one of us can say this point. Oh, the spirit of me. Who's going to save me from this? Who's going to step into my life and save me from my despicableness? Despicableness. Paul made that in the wrong set. It's Jesus Christ. Oh. But you've got to choose it. Maybe you need to open your heart and your minds to Jesus this morning and to do that. Would you just open your hearts and minds to it? Would you choose Him this morning more than anything else in your life or anyone else in your life? Would you choose Him for this morning? Lord Jesus, would you just help us to deal with our despicable selves? Would you help me, Lord, to deal with the sin in my own life? Would you help me, God, to deal with other people that I come in contact with? That, Lord, I won't make immediate judgments about them. Even those that I see quite often, God, that I will not make immediate judgments about them. Lord, will you help me to stay in tune with the church that we talk to, to be a member, to serve here, to do what you ask me to do? God, I pray. Would you speak to our hearts and our minds this morning, Lord? Bring us to the point we need to be. So that even when we want to do that, 